Hi, I'm Bill Sealove. I'm a fourth year medical student. I'm going to talk to you about amenorrhea. But before we get into amenorrhea, let's look into what it is that goes into making a period happen to begin with. You start off with a signal from the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus puts out a hormone called GNRH, gonadotropin releasing hormone. And it puts out this GNRH in a pulsatile kind of code, sort of like Morse code or binary code. That, and this conveys a particular message to the pituitary gland. Pituitary gland hears this signal and interprets it and says, OK. So the hypothalamus wants me to make uh, this much luteinizing hormone and this much follicular stimulating hormone. Pituitary puts out LH and FSH. And the LH and FSH travel down to the ovary to give the, odor, the uh, ovary orders. Go down to the ovary. And these hormones go over to a follicle which is just basically an egg that's surrounded by granulosa cells that are kind of cuboid shaped. And around the granulosa cells are spindle shaped theca cells. Now the theca cells only want to listen to luteinizing hormone. They've got LH receptors. And the granulosa cells only want to listen to follicle stimulating hormone. They've got FSH receptors. The uh, LH goes over to the theca cells and says, hey, theca cells, there's a bunch of cholesterol laying around the uh, ovary. You got cholesterol here. I want you theca cells to make this cholesterol into androgen. So the theca cells say, OK, and they make the cholesterol into androgen. Then the uh, FSH goes over to the granulosa cells and says, do you see what those theca cells have done? They've made a bunch of androgen. This is a mess. Can you make something useful out of this androgen? Can you?" cook it up into estrogen for me? And the granulosa cells say, sure, yeah, we can do that. We'll make some estrogen. So they convert the androgen into estrogen. And the estrogen is great for the follicle. It helps the ovum uh, develop and mature, and it helps the follicle as a whole develop and mature from a primary follicle into a secondary follicle and then a graphene follicle. I kind of like to think of the whole thing really like a barbecue. It's kind of like the pituitary is a master chef. And he's uh, yelling out orders to his workers. First he yells out, uh, hey, let's cut up some hamburger meat. LH is like, let's cut up some hamburger meat. And this order goes down to the uh, theca cells who are like butchers. And they say, yeah, sure, we can do that. And they uh, cut up cholesterol, which is like a side of beef, cut it up into uh, ground chuck, which is like androgen, raw hamburger meat. And then the pituitary thinks it says, uh, "Yeah, okay, that's enough. Uh, that's enough raw hamburger meat. Uh, fry up some of that hamburger meat. FSH. Fry up some hamburger meat." This order goes down to the granulosa cells, and the granulosa cells are like cooks. And they're like, uh, we, we, uh, we will uh, cook up the hamburger meat, no problem. So they take the uh, androgens and they cook it up into estrogen, like making juicy, tasty quarter pounders out of uh, raw meat. And, uh, and that's what the estrogen is. And estrogen, as we just said, is really good for the follicle, helps it develop and grow. That's the local effect of estrogen, but estrogen also some of it ends up uh, getting out into the peripheral circulation. 
and estrogen ends up getting over to the uterus. And when the estrogen gets to the uterus, starts telling the uterus what to do. It says, hey, uterus, uh, I'll tell you what. Got a lot of nice uh, endometrium here. But it'd be nice if there was more endometrium. Why don't, you, uh, why don't you endometrial cells proliferate? So the endometrial cells do. They, uh, they proliferate. They start multiplying. Meanwhile, back at the ovary, after some time passes, things start to change a little bit. The, uh, the follicle grows and develops under the influence of estrogen. And then after a while, theca cells and granulosa cells stop making androgens and estrogen and start turning over production into progesterone. They start making progesterone. Here's a follicle and uh, starts to make progesterone. And the progesterone has a couple of interesting effects. One thing is it gets the theca cells to start making proteolytic enzymes. And the proteolytic enzymes start breaking down the ovarian uh, cortex that surrounds the follicle. Another thing the progesterone does is the progesterone gets a bunch of blood vessels to start growing around the uh, follicle. And it also gets uh, prostaglandins to come and make these blood vessels leaky. So you end up getting a bunch of uh, transudate go into the follicle. And you end up building a bunch of pressure behind the egg. So with all this transudate, all this fluid building up behind the egg, all this pressure, and in front of the egg having the ovarian cortex break down so that there's hardly anything left in front of the egg, pressure behind and broken cortex in front, you know that egg once is going to end up blowing out of there. The cortex is going to blow apart and the egg will fly out into the uterine tubes. And it does. It goes out into the uterine tubes. That's what ovulation is. And after ovulation, the corpus luteum starts to undergo some wild changes. It turns into what's called, the, the, uh, the follicle rather, turns into what's called a corpus luteum. And the corpus luteum starts putting out a whole bunch of progesterone. Now it's really pumping out progesterone big time. The progesterone goes over to the endometrium, and, uh, and it's got an attitude. It says, hey, what's going on here? I know that estrogen had you guys proliferating like rabbits or something, but this is chaotic. This is a mess. You're going to stop proliferating. Stop proliferating right now. I'm the new sheriff in town, and I'm telling you how it's going to be. You're going to stop proliferating and you're going to start uh, maturing. You're going to grow up, and you're going to differentiate. So the endometrial cells start doing just that. They start growing up. They start beefing up and, uh, and differentiating. And the progesterone also says, uh, another thing I want is I want some, uh, some roads through here. I want to organize things with some nice roads to bring out supplies to the endometrium. So you end up getting spiral arteries develop. And the spiral arteries supply the endometrium with abundant oxygen and food and so forth. So the endometrium really thrives. Uh, under the benevolent rule of progesterone, things are great in the land of the endometrium. It's all getting prepared so that if, a, uh, if the egg gets fertilized, it'll have a nice lush landscape to live off of. And as a matter of fact, if an egg did get fertilized and was to implant on the, uh, on the uterus, then things could go on going like that for a long time. Because a trophoblast, if it landed on the endometrium, would send back signals in the form of beta-HCG 
And beta HCG would, uh, would say nice things to the corpus luteum and get it to want to keep on living for a long time, keep on making progesterone, and things could go on for quite a while like that. But if you don't get a fertilized egg, which typically you won't, then the corpus luteum is going to get depressed, and it's going to just blow up in two weeks. Without hearing nice things from beta HCG, corpus luteum kills itself. And if, when the corpus luteum dies, then you lose your progesterone. And if you lose your progesterone, then you've got a real problem. Because with the progesterone gone, then all those nice spiral arteries that were developed, they're going to constrict. Without progesterone telling them to stay uh, patent, they just close right up. And that cuts off the blood supply to the entire endometrium. Now, the entire endometrium, the whole decidua functionalis, is completely deprived, completely ischemic. And it dies. It dies en masse, the whole thing. It's huge, horrible carnage. And the entire endometrium gets sloughed off and drained out of the vagina in a big bloody massacre that we know of as a menstrual period. What can stop the period from happening? The menstrual period could be stopped, as we said earlier, by pregnancy. If you get a pregnancy, if you get a trophoblast implanting in the endometrium, then it's going to send up beta HCG that will keep the corpus luteum alive. That could cause amenorrhea. We also have some pathological causes of amenorrhea that we'll go ahead and take a look at now. These pathological causes can be broken up into primary causes and secondary causes. You know what? Let's further break these down, kind of look at this systematically, and break down the causes of amenorrhea according to which link in the chain they break. Do they hit at the hypothalamus, at the pituitary, at the ovary, or at the uterus? We'll start at the top, at the hypothalamus. What's a hypothalamic cause of primary amenorrhea? By the way, primary amenorrhea just means you've never had a period before, where secondary amenorrhea means you used to get periods, but now you don't anymore. Hypothalamic cause of primary amenorrhea, the most important one you're going to see, is going to be Kalman syndrome. Kalman. Kalman syndrome comes about from a failure to express a particular adhesion molecule. Adhesion molecules are needed by certain cells so that during the embryological phase, they can pull themselves along and migrate over to what their ultimate destination is supposed to be. And these adhesion molecules are particularly important to uh, GnRH secreting nerves and to olfactory nerves that are supposed to go to the olfactory cortex. So without these adhesion molecules, the GnRH nerves never make it to the hypothalamus, and the olfactory nerves never migrate to the olfactory cortex. As a result, the patient never matures sexually and isn't able to smell. So that's our uh, hypothalamic cause of primary amenorrhea. Now let's look at some uh, hypothalamic causes of secondary amenorrhea. One of these is going to be too much stress. Another one is anorexia or starving. And another one is too much exercise. With stress, you get a release of corticotropin releasing hormone, which causes a release of cortisol. And cortisol is going to disrupt GnRH pulsatility. It's going to slow down GnRH pulsatility so that you don't get enough luteinizing hormone and follicular stimulating hormone made so that your 
follicles never develop and you never get estrogen or progesterone or anything, so you never get your period. Anorexia is going to work in a somewhat similar manner, but it's going to decrease lute uh, excuse me, it's going to decrease leptin, and decreased leptin causes an increase in something called neuropeptide Y. And that also is going to end up doing the same thing to GnRH. It's going to decrease GnRH pulsatility so that you don't get your FSH and LH and so forth. And too much exercise is going to cause increased opiates or endorphins. And these increased opiates are going to do the same thing. They're going to decrease GnRH pulsatility. All right, so we've covered hypothalamic causes of amenorrhea. So let's move on to the pituitary and look at pituitary causes of amenorrhea. Not really anything too high yield so far as pituitary causes of primary amenorrhea. So let's move on to pituitary causes of secondary amenorrhea. One of these is going to be a non-functional adenoma. An adenoma, of course, is like a tumor that just grows and takes up space. And uh, the adenoma is kind of a real bully. It just impinges on the uh, normal pituitary parenchyma. And the LH and FSH, uh, they have a very low threshold for uh, being beat up on. So they're just like, ah, I can't work under these conditions. This guy is just too much. So the LH and FSH just drop everything. They say, forget this. I'm not going to make my stuff anymore. I, I, I refuse. I'm not going to put out any more LH and any more FSH. So as a result of that, of course, you end up getting amenorrhea. Another kind of tumor that you can get is something called a uh, prolactinoma. And that, of course, is a sort of a functioning pituitary adenoma. And what it does is it makes prolactin. And prolactin, as it turns out, causes a reflexive increase in dopamine. Because dopamine is a natural antagonist of prolactin. It helps keep prolactin from being developed, from being put out. So you get this increase in dopamine and dopamine causes a decrease in GnRH pulsatility. Another pituitary cause of amenorrhea is a little bit more indirect. And what I'm talking about here is hypothyroidism. When the uh, thyroid gland puts out less thyroxin, then this gets, this causes an increase in TRH to try to make up for this decrease in thyroxine. An increased TRH causes an increase in TSH, and it also causes an increase in prolactin. And we've, as we've just established, increased prolactin causes an increase in dopamine, so again, you end up with decreased GnRH pulsatility. All right, so now we're down to the ovary. Let's talk about ovarian causes of amenorrhea. As far as ovarian causes of primary amenorrhea, the main one you're going to be looking at is Turner syndrome. Turner syndrome is, of course, just failure of the ovaries to ever even develop to begin with. If the ovaries don't develop, You've got no follicles to respond to the FSH and LH. You never get your estrogen and progesterone. So there are no hormones for the uterus to work with to end up making a period. As far as uh, ovarian causes of secondary amenorrhea, the main thing, of course, we're looking at is premature ovarian failure. This is just maybe the ovaries running out of follicles before the patient turns 40, or uh, possibly an autoimmune attack on the ovaries so that the follicles are destroyed. 
So now we're down already to uterine causes of uh, amenorrhea. Now, as far as uterine causes of primary amenorrhea, one of the major ones we get is not having a uterus to begin with. If there's no uterus, then obviously there's nothing for the hormones to work with to end up making a menstrual cycle. So you don't get any, uh, you don't get a menstrual period. One way that you could not have a uterus is something called malarian agenesis. The uterus is formed embryologically from paramesonephric ducts uh, coming and fusing together to form the uterus. Paramesonephric ducts are also called malarian ducts. And if for some reason these ducts don't come together, you call it malarian agenesis. Another cause of no uterus might be androgen insensitivity syndrome. Here what's going on is that the little girl was actually genotymic, genotypically a little boy. And uh, he just looked like a little girl because he didn't have receptors to sense testosterone. So that he ended up developing the external genitalia of a girl. His malarian inhibitory factor receptors, though, were working just fine. So when he put out the malarian inhibitory factor, as all boys do, it prevented the development of a uterus. Thus, there's no uterus. Now we can move on to obstructive causes of uh, amenorrhea at the uterus, primary. Here, there's a couple of different possibilities. One is called a transverse vaginal septum. During embryological development, the paramesonephric ducts form the uterus, of course, and the cervix, and they form the top third of the vagina, the proximal third. And this ends up uh, fusing together with the urogenital sinus, which forms the lower two-thirds of the vagina. If the top third of the vagina doesn't fuse properly with the lower two-thirds, then you can get a sheet of tissue in there called a transverse vaginal septum. And that, of course, would obstruct the flow of blood out during a menstrual period. Therefore, to all uh, appearances, there would be no menstrual period. You can also get an obstruction further down, right at the entrance of the vagina, called an imperforate hymen. An imperforate hymen is from uh, the membrane at the entrance of the vagina. Ordinarily, it is supposed to develop holes in it so that blood can pass out. If these holes never develop, then the blood can't pass, and you end up not being able to pass a menstrual period. So that's another uh, cause of primary amenorrhea. Now we come to uterine causes of secondary amenorrhea, and these are all going to be obstructive. First one we'll talk about is Asherman syndrome. Here's how that works. All right, if a woman, say, has like a high to form mole, or if she, uh, if she has an incomplete abortion or something and needs a dilation and curatage, then they'll put an instrument in called a curette into the uterus and scrape away some of the endometrium. If in their scraping, they're overzealous and take away too much of the decidua basalis, like the root layer of the endometrium, then you can get an inflammatory reaction and the uterine walls will stick to one another. When they stick to one another, then the blood's not able to pass out. You've got obstruction that 
keeps the menstrual period from flowing. Another cause is cervical stenosis. Cervical stenosis is going to come from, uh, say, you have a cone biopsy done on a woman. Say a woman has cervical cancer. So they go in with a knife and they cut out a piece of the cervix, like right around the canal. After that, you might have uh, an overzealous fibrotic reaction in the cervix that causes it to constrict too much. And this constriction can cause a blockage of the outflow of blood that prevents menses. OK. So we've covered all these uh, causes of amenorrhea, but there's one that we didn't cover, one that we didn't put up here, and that's polycystic ovarian syndrome. The reason I didn't put polycystic ovarian syndrome up here yet is because it's not exactly clear where it should be classified, whether it should be at the hypothalamus, pituitary, ovaries, etc. It's kind of hotly debated. Some people think that polycystic ovarian syndrome is mainly a problem with the ovaries. And other people think it's mainly a problem of the hypothalamus. It's actually probably sort of a, a confluence of issues coming together that, uh, that ends up making PCOS happen. But it's easiest to think about as primarily a problem of, of insulin resistance, where cells aren't, uh, aren't responding to insulin. They're not willing to uh, take in glucose in response to insulin. So you get an increase in glucose. And this freaks out the pancreas. It says there's too much glucose. So it puts out a bunch, of, uh, bunch more insulin. So you get hyperinsulinemia and increased insulin ends up wreaking havoc on the hypothalamus and distorts the GnRH code it puts out in a very peculiar way. It makes it so that the GnRH code translates to making a major increase in luteinizing hormone and a decrease in follicular stimulating hormone. What's going to be the consequences of that? What happens if we have way more LH and less FSH? Well, all this LH is going to go over to the theca cells and say, hey, guys, cut up a bunch of cholesterol into androgen. Let's make a whole ton of androgen. Make a whole bunch of raw ground beef. Meanwhile, the FSH is saying, uh, you know, just a trickle of FSH is coming down. So it's saying, uh, yeah, take it easy, guys. Just make a couple of uh, burgers here and there. Make just a little bit of estrogen, but don't worry about it. So what do you get? You get a huge buildup of androgen, a bunch of androgen being built up, and the granulosa cells not at all keeping up. So with this huge buildup of androgen, it's like having too much raw meat at a picnic or something. Everybody gets E. coli and dies. In the same way, androgen is like poison to the uh, developing follicle. And it ends up making the follicle go atretic and die. So the follicle is dying before it ever fully develops. It never becomes a secondary follicle, it never becomes a graphene follicle, and it never spits out its egg. So therefore, you never end up even getting a corpus luteum. You never get your big progesterone production that makes the uterus develop. So you never get your, uh, your progesterone withdrawal uh, situation that cuts off the spiral arteries and makes the uh, endometrium go ischemic and gives you your menstrual period. So that's why with polycystic ovarian syndrome, you get amenorrhea.